To learn more about earning college credits with Study Hall courses, visit gostudyhall.com or click the link in the description. I think we can all agree that you wouldn't walk around with your credit card number printed on the back of a t-shirt, ready to be stolen. And so you wouldn't want to expose your data in digital ways either. The concept of protecting data in your code from being tampered with is called data hiding, and data hiding is just one line of defense to make our software secure. In addition to keeping user data private, we want our code to stay organized Organized, run smoothly, and not completely crash if we make a mistake. So in this episode, we'll learn a final set of foundational tools to implement Java classes like a pro. Hi, I'm Sabrina Cruz, and this is Study Hall, code and programming for beginners. Many programming languages include some options for data hiding. The process of organizing your code in a specific secure way that protects the information inside of your classes. In Java, data hiding is partially implemented by using access modifiers that are kind of like bouncers that indicate whether a piece of code is designated public for open use or private with restricted access. But Java's high security attitude goes beyond access modifiers. There are also secure operations that Java programmers can use to update their class instance variables. When we introduced classes, we created a party guest class and talked about how to instantiate or create an object and supply some arguments to the class constructor. And we saw how those argument values are stored in instance variables that are declared in the class definition. Until now, we've been using the dot operator to access instance variables. And that's been working fine. But there's a better method to safely access and modify any stored data. In fact, there are two kinds of better methods getter and setter methods. As you might have guessed from their names, these methods allow us to get and set the value of instance variables. Using them is much more secure than simply assigning a value with an equal sign because of how these methods restrict user access. It's worth clarifying who the users are in this situation. Because we're writing raw code here, as opposed to a full-fledged website or app, the users we're talking about are other programmers. Like if we are scientists sharing code, or work for a big development team. What we're doing here is controlling the actions that other programmers can take when they're using code that we created. And with getter and setter methods in place, these users can't access any variables directly. All they can do is run a method to safely and indirectly modify those variables. The contents of a private variable can only be directly accessed or changed inside the same class where the variable is declared, which usually means that that only the person who originally wrote the code, in this case, us, can make those kinds of changes. So now let's practice implementing getters and setters to protect our data. Remember how we threw a lasagna potluck before where anyone could attend? This time, it's a VIP lasagna potluck for only the top chefs in the world. We can code a private party guest class for easy comparison with our party guest class from before. First, we declare all the instance variables to be private. It. This means that users won't be able to access data with the dot operator, even if they tried. Unlike some other languages that trust programmers to know what we're doing, I'm looking at you, Python, we're outsourcing that responsibility. The private keyword is basically enlisting the Java compiler to help us enforce some access rules. Here, we're saying that the only person who can access data with the dot operator is the person who wrote this code. Next, instead of supplying arguments to a class constructor method, if we don't have another constructor, we can create the guest object with a default constructor. Remember, the default constructor takes no arguments, and Java will assign default values to instance variables, like empty strings or zero for integers. Then we can set the attributes one at a time using the setter method. Here, we set the favorite drink attribute of our guest object to ginger ale. Using getter methods lets us retrieve the data stored in any instance variable. So let's print it out to make Make sure everything worked. Now, you might be thinking, but Sabrina, you access that data just fine. How is this more secure since anyone who knows about getter and setter methods can mess with the instance variables? Well, we can use this structure to implement secure checks before we reassign a variable. For example, to secure the setAge method,
method, we can make sure that the integer isn't less than 0 or more than 100. If anyone tries an invalid number here, Java will now throw an illegal argument exception and the new value won't be assigned. Our code will be safe and sound. The point here is that the author of a program can add secure checks so that the user, another programmer, doesn't have to think too much about the nitty gritty technical details. In theory, a user could build a new private party guest object without having in-depth knowledge about classes. And that's kind of the goal of computer programming in general. When we create a simple interface that doesn't force the user to understand how everything works behind the scenes, we call it abstraction. By using getter and setter methods to interact with our class attributes, we're kind of creating a middleman between the user and the inner workings of the code. In other words, we're abstracting complexity away from the user. We also made sure to set this code so that the attributes, getters, setters, and even the main method are all inside the private party guest class. In computer science terms, we would say that all these methods and their data are encapsulated within the same class. In software engineering, we need to rely on many distinct pieces of a program that each have specific responsibilities. This becomes difficult, or even impossible, when the pieces aren't organized and one part can accidentally interfere with another. Encapsulation can reduce the risk of that kind of interference and keep our classes separate from each other. Our public party guest class from before had a well-designed parameterized constructor that made it quick and simple to instantiate a new object with a bunch of instance variables. But in our current code, as you might have noticed, you have to call a lot of methods to set all of the instance variables for a private party guest object. We have to interact with the object a lot more in order to access any actual functionality. This system of organizing our code doesn't have extra steps just to be annoying. It serves a bigger purpose called Object-Oriented Programming, or OOP for short or OOP for whimsy. Usually, OOP systems involve creating an object and then running additional code to modify that object. Ideally, each method and attribute encapsulated in the object has a clear, distinct job and a descriptive name. If you imagine debugging as searching for a needle in a haystack, then coding with object-oriented programming is like preemptively breaking that haystack into smaller piles of hay. That way, the needle is much easier to find. And by encapsulating our code, into these smaller hay bales, we also make it much easier to protect our program from a big barn fire or a system crash. With OOP organization, our code will run more smoothly and our data will stay more secure. Languages like Java that emphasize this style of programming are called object-oriented languages. And Java is a great learning environment because it forces you to learn the rules of OOP and establish good habits early. We've been learning about the building blocks of object-oriented programming this whole time. Another important good habit is called defensive programming. We actually got a glimpse of it earlier in this episode. While object-oriented programming encourages us to structure our code in a clear and organized way, defensive programming ensures that our code is robust and that it can handle unexpected situations. In other words, defensive programming adds an extra layer of protection to prevent our code from crashing or malfunctioning when things go wrong. This comes in handy when we run security checks, correct for common mistakes, or want a specific format for user input. To help us picture defensive programming, let's imagine there's a security guard at uh, some place that we really need security, like a very exclusive lasagna potluck. Now, their job is to check a list of valid IDs before they let anyone in. And if a new ID passes their specific series of checks, they add it to the list for next time. Now, let's say that this potluck decides to replace their human security guard with a computer program to do the exact same thing. Automation comes for us all. To define the security guard class, we'll first add the ID list as a required attribute, since every security guard object will need one. Here's where the defensive programming comes in, the code that checks the format for every new ID. Now let's assume that every potluck guest ID needs to be exactly eight characters long. The straightforward way to implement this format check would be to add an ID to the ID list as long as it has eight characters and the isValidID format method returns true. But 
that's not actually the ideal solution. We should try to add a check before executing a code block so we don't run a potentially unnecessary process, especially when there's a lot of code below the check. Running one line of code is almost always better than running several, and this approach makes your computer a lean machine. So the better way to implement this format check looks kind of backwards. If the isValidID format method doesn't return true, then don't add the ID. Instead, print a message, return, and don't even bother checking the list in a later step. A conditional that implements if not then don't logic is called a guard clause, not because we're working with a security guard class, but because it adds another layer of defense to our program. If we weren't using guard clauses here, we'd need to split up the code into if else blocks. That would technically be fine, but it would give us a much longer version of the add to ID list method. So the coolest thing about guard clauses is that they basically handle both the if and else block in one efficient and concise condition. To wrap up the rest of our code, we make sure that the ID isn't already on our list and then finally display a message to the user. With that, the computer security guard has done its job with a little help from defensive programming. Object-oriented programming and defensive programming work together to provide different kinds of protection. We can think of OOP as a way to protect our code against internal issues because it keeps the distinct components of our code or organized and available to do their jobs, which is important because it's pretty hard to protect data if you don't even know where it is. Then defensive programming protects our code against external issues and foreseeing problems like unexpected user inputs and format errors that can mess with internal data. We've worked really hard to create clean code and now we can feel confident about sharing it far and wide. So keep these concepts in mind as you continue to practice your programming skills. Your code might work, but ask yourself yourself. Am I actually doing this in the safest and best way? And now that we have a bunch of foundational Java tools and best practices under our belt, we're ready to take our code to the next level. If you're enjoying Study Hall Code and Programming for Beginners and are interested in taking an online course and earning college credit, check out GoStudyHall.com or click on the button to learn more. Thanks for watching and see you next time!